Hey guys, let's go ahead and start reading this final lesson in this chapter seven on the dwarf planets and other planets. So it is lesson four. So let's go ahead and get our reading essential set up with the categories. So dwarf planets, red. Asteroids, green. Comets, yellow. and meteoroids purple. So then we could come here to the end and we can see our final vocab words that we have for this chapter. Now remember it is the word, this book definition here, but it is not copying it and pasting it. You are actually going to type or write it, right? And then find some type of image from Google or draw a picture yourself. All right, so purple, yellow, green, red, okay? All right, let's get our notebook set up, our outline notes. All right, so, whoops, we've already done outer planets, haven't we? Okay, here we go. All right, dwarf planets in red. Asteroids, green, comets, yellow. And then purple down here four meteorites, okay? And then we come to the, then we are finished, come to the end there. Okay, so purple and yellow and green and red, okay? All right, you ready? Okay, final lesson of this chapter. So we're gonna take a look at what are the dwarf planets, what are the characteristics of comets and asteroids, and how does an impact crater form? Pluto once was considered a planet, but it is now classified as a dwarf planet. In 2006, the International Astronomical Union, IAU, adopted dwarf planet as a new category. The IAU defines a dwarf planet as an object that orbits the sun. All right, so, so far so good. Has enough mass and gravity to form a sphere. So, so far those are two of the three um, requirements for a planet. Um, and has similar mass orbiting near it or crossing its orbital path. Now, this is how it is different than a regular planet. Because remember with a regular planet, the um, mass of the planet has to be more than everything else around it combined. But with a dwarf planet, it might have um, other moons around it. And if you add up all of that mass, it's not going to be more than that particular planet. So that was the case with, um, with Pluto. Ast astronomers classify Pluto, Ceres, Aries, Make Make, and Haumea as dwarf planets. The figure below shows four dwarf planets. All dwarf planets are similar to Earth's moon. The figure below locates Ceres, Pluto, and, and Aries. These dwarf planets have a rocky core surrounded by a thick layer of ice. Okay. All right, so here is here is a picture of Pluto. Pluto, Ceres, and Aries each have a solid core surrounded by a thick layer of ice. All right, so then we have Ceres here. We have Aries. The Hubble telescope image shows Aries and its moon dysnomia. Okay. All righty. So Ceres, Ceres is the smallest of the dwarf planet. It orbits the sun in the asteroid belt. And our asteroid belt is going to be the space between Mars and Jupiter. So it's gonna be this space right here. Okay, um, it might have a rocky core. The thin, dusty crust covers a layer of water ice that surrounds the core. Pluto is about two-thirds the size of our moon. 
It is so far from the sun that its period of revolution is 248 years. We're going to be marking some of these period of revolutions and AUs on our notes page, similar to what we did with the inner and outer planets. The surface of Pluto is so cold, it is covered with frozen nitrogen. Its average temperature is minus 230 degrees Celsius. Pluto has three known moons, Charon, Hydra, and Nix. Charon is Pluto's largest moon. Okay, so it is also going to have a layer of ice. Oops. Okay. Aries is the largest dwarf planet. It was discovered in 2003. Aries takes about 557 years to complete one orbit around the sun. Dysnomia is the only known moon of Aries. And Makemake and Haumea are, were named dwarf planets in 2008. They orbit in the Kuiper Belt region of the solar system. Makemake is one of the largest objects in the Kuiper Belt. All right, so we are finished with that section. So let's go to our outline notes and get that filled in for dwarf planets. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, a dwarf planet is a sphere that orbits a sun. A dwarf planet has, has objects similar in mass orbiting near it <clears throat> or crossing its orbital path. So that's why it is not a regular planet because it's uh, that dwarf planet's mass is not more than adding everything up around it it's not more than that, so it's it's not a regular planet. The dwarf planet in the solar systems are Pluto, Ceres, Aries, Makemake, and Haumea. Ceres is located in the asteroid belt. It is the smallest dwarf planet in the solar system. Okay, so um, the AU for Ceres is 2.77. Now that makes sense because the AU for... Um, for Mars, whoops, is 1.52. And this is going to be living in the asteroid belt, <clears throat> which is between Mars and Jupiter. So 1.52 is the AU for Mars, and then 5.20 for Jupiter. So that is going to make sense that 2.77 is going to fall within that space between Mars and Jupiter. That's why knowing these AUs can place any object in our solar system, because is it before or after a known um, planet that we know it's AU for? All right, so its revolution is 4.66. Okay, and then we're all right, so stop and pause and get all of that written in. That also makes sense because it is a little bit further than Mars, but not quite far as the 12 years of Jupiter, and a little bit more than a 1.88 of Mars. So it's probably a little closer to Mars than it is to Jupiter, but it's in that space. Okay, just simply based on the numbers. All right, Pluto has a rocky core surrounded by ice, and it's covered with frozen nitrogen. Now, the periodic table um, symbol for nitrogen is a capital N. Its AU is 339.5, and its revolution is 248 years. All right, so if we compare that to Neptune, Neptune's AU is 30.1. And then we have Pluto at 39.5. So it was, when we had nine planets that we um, were listing, it was the farthest out. Okay. Um, it has three known moons. Aries is the largest dwarf planet. It is three times farther from the sun than the dwarf planet Pluto. So its AU is 68. So it's 68 times 150 million kilometers. Okay, its revolution is 557 years. 
Makimaki and Haumea are dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt. And we'll talk about that Kuiper Belt a little bit later. All right, so pause this. Make sure you have everything filled in for dwarf planets. And we see that we are at asteroids. So we are ready to move on to our reading essential and read this little section on asteroids. Okay. All right, let's change this. Recall that asteroids are chunks of rock and ice that never clumped together to form a planet. Most asteroids orbit the sun in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. There are hundreds of thousands of asteroids. Pallas is the largest asteroid. Some astronomers suggest that asteroids are very old objects left over from the formation of the solar system. Alrighty, so we see that we are at comets, so we are ready to fill in our outline notes for asteroids. Asteroids orbit the sun in a band between Mars and Jupiter. The largest asteroid is called Pallas. Asteroids are chunks of rock and ice. So this is known as the asteroid belt. Okay. the space between Mars and Jupiter. All right, so pause and get this written in. We see we are already at comets. This was a very short little section. And so we are ready for our reading essentials on comets. Comets are a mixture of particles of rock and ice and dust. The particles' gravity holds them loosely together. The, as shown below, comets orbit the sun in stretched out elliptical orbits. We watched a video on that, that's those eccentric orbits. All right, so let's take a look here. So take a look at what this looks like, all right? So pay very close attention to that. So the visible parts of a comet are the coma, the dust tail and the gas tail. So you can see that. You can see that we've got this center part right here, right? And then we have two, uh, we have a gas tail coming up over here. And then we have a, there we go, we've got gas tail and we have a dust tail, okay? So the coma surrounds the comet's nucleus. So this picture shows, so here comes this comet. You know, it's coming in like so, and it's going to make this very, very long, thin orbit. This image of the nucleus of Wild 2 comet was taken by the Stardust space probe. The nucleus was too far from the sun to have a bright coma. So some comets have tails more than 100 million kilometers long. So you are going to need to identify this picture of a comet, okay? So make sure that you um, go out and look at several pictures of what a comet looks like, all right? Okay, so this one here, right here. This is one that was, was talking about that it was too far. It hadn't gotten close enough to start to glow yet, and we're gonna read about that in a second. Okay, the structure, the inner, solid inner part of the comet is the nucleus. As the comet moves closer to the sun, it absorbs thermal energy. Higher temperatures cause the ice in the comet to turn into a gas. Energy from the sun pushes some of the gas and dust away from the comet's, comet's nucleus and makes it glow. This produces the comet's bright tail and glowing no nucleus called a coma. The coma surrounds the comet's nucleus. When energy from the sun strikes the gas and dust in the comet's nucleus, it creates a two-part tail, a dust tail and a gas tail. The gas tail always points away from the sun. All right. So we take a look, re referencing that up there. Okay, so then we have two different kinds of, 
of comets and it really depends on like where they're coming from. So we have a short period comet, it takes less than 200 years to orbit the sun and they come from the Kuiper belt. So where does the Kuiper belt start? Well, the Kuiper belt is going to be from Neptune out to about 50 AU from the sun. So we know that Neptune is 30 AU. So 30 AU to 50 AU is going to be the um, Kuiper belt. So then we have another kind. We have a long period comet, and it takes um, more than 200 years to orbit the sun. Long period comets come from an area at the outer edge of the solar system called the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud surrounds the solar system and extends about 100,000 AU from the sun. Some long period comets take millions of years to orbit the sun. That's pretty cool. All righty, so we are at meteoroids, so we are ready for our outline notes. So let's take a look at comet. All right, so comets are made up of rock, ice, and dust. Gravity between the particles in a comet holds it together. Comets orbit the sun in long elliptical orbits. As a comet approaches the sun, a bright tail can develop on the comet. The nucleus is the solid inner part of a comet. As the comet approaches the sun, it heats, changing some ice in the nucleus into a gas. Energy from the sun pushes gas and dust particles away from the nucleus and makes it glow. All right, so you are going to need to know the visible parts of the comet. That would be the coma, the dust tail, and the gas tail. Also make sure that you can pick um, out a picture of a comet. All right, with those tails, you should be able to differentiate that. You should be able to see that, that we've got a gas tail and a dust tail. All right. Okay, so pause here if you need to to get these written in. We have a little teeny bit more left on the comet. Okay, short period comets take less than 200 years to orbit the sun. They usually come from the Kuiper belt, and the Kuiper belt is Neptune out to about 50 AUs. So that's 30 AUs to 50 AUs is where the Kuiper belt is. So then we have our long period comets take more than 200 years to orbit the sun. They come from the Oort cloud. And the Oort cloud surrounds the solar system and it extends out 100 thousand AUs. So we're talking 100,000 times 150 million kilometers. Okay, it's pretty far. <laughs> All right, so the, between, the difference between these short-term and long-term ones is really, is it less than 200? Is it more than 200? Is it coming from the Kuiper belt? Is it coming from the Oort cloud? All right, so we see here now that we are at meteoroids. So make sure you stop this video get all of that written in for your comments. Then we are ready for our last little section, okay? All right, meteoroids. So this is where we are gonna come up with our vocab for this section. Millions of particles called meteoroids enter Earth's atmosphere every day. A meteoroid is a small rocky particle that moves through space. Most meteoroids are only about as big as a grain of sand. As a meteoroid passes through Earth's atmosphere, it creates friction. So, that's the friction between the meteoroid and the air causes around it. Um, the friction makes the meteoroid and the air around it hot enough to glow. So a meteor is a streak of light in Earth's atmosphere made by a glowing meteoroid. Now, 
Many times people will call this a shooting star. But in actuality, it is a meteor that you are seeing. Most meteoroids burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Some are large enough that they reach Earth's surface before they completely burn up. When this happens, the meteoroid is in a meteorite. A meteorite is a meteoroid that strikes a planet or a moon. When a large meteorite strikes a planet or moon, it often forms a bowl-shaped impact crater. An impact crater is a round depression formed on the surface of a planet, moon, or other space object by the impact of a meteorite. Earth's surface has more than 170 impact craters. Now we know we've talked about impact craters um, on our moon and several other um, planets, uh, inner planets, uh, just from meteorites, okay? So our meteoroid, so really bottom line here is that um, a meteoroid, meteor, or meteorite, it all depends on where it is. If we've got these um, rocky particles and that they just stay in space, okay, it's a meteoroid. It's going to stay in space and just goes round and round and round um, through, our, through space, okay? Now, as soon as it hits our atmosphere, okay, so we have Earth's atmosphere here. So as soon as this space, uh, these chunks of space rock, um, rocky particles move through our atmosphere then, then it is going to cause a streak of light because it's a friction. Now this here is going to be called, uh, let's make that blue, a meteor. Okay. Now, Let's say it makes it all the way through our atmosphere. We've had that streak of light. We've had that friction between that object and, our, and the air in our, our atmosphere, friction causing it up uh, to heat it up and causing it to burn up. If it makes it all the way through to our Earth and hits the ground, okay, hits the ground, then it is called a meteorite if it strikes the earth. And sometimes, if it's big enough, it's going to cause an impact crater. Okay, so uh, make sure that you are able to differentiate uh, meteor, meteorite, uh, meteoroid, impact crater, okay? So stop this video and get all of this written in. And we will then be ready to do our final little section on our outline notes. Okay. A small rocky particle that moves through space is a meteoroid. Okay, so as long as it stays out in space, it's a meteoroid. As it passes through Earth's atmosphere, friction with the air makes a meteoroid and the air um, around it glow. The streak of light in that atmosphere, zoot, the streak of light in the atmosphere make, made by a glowing meteoroid is called a meteor. Most meteoroids burn up in the atmosphere. A meteoroid that strikes the surface of a planet or a moon, the meteoroid that strikes the surface of a planet or a moon is called a meteorite. Now, the meteorite can form a bowl-shaped depression called an impact crater in the surface it strikes, so if it's large enough, okay? All right, so as long as it's out in space, moving through space, it's meteoroid. This gets close enough and gets into our Earth's atmosphere and making that friction between the rocky particle and then our atmospheric gases, um, heats that up, it's going to glow, that's a meteor, all right? So most of them are going to burn up there. But if it makes it all the way through that and strikes our Earth or Moon, then it is a meteorite, okay? 
and can form an impact crater. All right, so make sure you have all of that written in. All right, all right, so uh, scroll through, um, rewind if you need to get any of this um, information, because that is the end, folks. We are finished with lesson four.